today on the Perception in Action podcast, looking at motor learning as a search within perceptual motor workspace. How do performers find stable regions in this workspace? And how does their search depend on their intrinsic dynamics and how they're coached? So it's time for a call to action. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, I want to look at the search strategies approach to skill acquisition proposed by Carl Newell and colleagues. But before we get to that, I want to talk briefly about something I've seen raised a few times lately on social media and also in the discussions I've had with coaches. That is that many people writing, talking, and posting about skill acquisition and motor learning seem to be using a lot of overly complicated language and terminology that makes it very difficult for someone new to the field to understand what the heck we're all talking about. While I agree on the one hand that using a flowery $10 word where a simple 10 cent one will do is counterproductive, I don't think we should carry this too far, especially when we're talking about terminology associated with specific theories in this area. For example, terms like affordance, emergence, attunement, intrinsic dynamics, and redundancy all have highly specific meanings within the ecological and dynamical approaches to skill acquisition. So I think that's important that we continue to use them and use them in the right way. And there's definitely going to be some pretty heavy terms in today's episode, but I'll do my best to try and explain them. For this episode, I want to focus on the really nice review article published recently by Pacheco, Laffey, and Newell in Frontiers in Psychology. In it, they begin by a call for the need to try to understand motor learning on a more individual level. This is an issue I've talked about a lot already in the podcast. In a large part due to the way we conduct research and do statistical analyses in this area, there has long been two assumptions we've made about skill acquisition. First, that combining data from a group of individuals, for example looking at means or averages, accurately summarizes the change of each individual. And second, that the task conditions during skill acquisition are sufficiently constraining such that we should expect learning to be similar for all individuals. Stated another way, learning is thought to be largely homogeneous and convergent on a single common solution. This is what allows us to try and make broad statements like, random practice is better than block practice. We are assuming that the variability within each of these training groups is relatively small. For example, we all respond to block practice in a similar way, while the variability between groups is relatively large. As discussed very nicely in this article by Pacheco and colleagues, there are many reasons to now eject these assumptions. Research has shown that individuals come to the practice field with different intrinsic dynamics and individual constraints. They differ in the initial conditions for practice, and for most of the tasks we care about in sports, there are multiple redundant ways in which the movement task can be solved. Therefore, it is not necessary, or even likely, that a group of individuals will all show the same pattern of learning and converge onto the same solution, even under highly similar task conditions. This is an issue that's actually slowed the progress of my research lately. I've had to abandon a lot of the group-level analyses and manipulations I've used in the past and try to learn and come up with new ways to evaluate skill acquisition on an individual level. The authors next propose a way to look at skill acquisition on an individual level, the search strategies approach first discussed by Newell and colleagues in 1998. Within this theoretical framework, it is proposed that motor learning is a process of searching through perceptual motor workspace for a solution to the task requirement. This search involves the movement in the space from unstable to stable equilibrium regions. Stability occurs through the attunement of the perceptual systems to the task dynamics, together with modifications of the action as task and intrinsic dynamics cooperate and or compete. Through practice and the search process, individuals adapt to pick up task-relevant perceptual variables and change their movement form according to the stability of the performed action and its outcome in relation to the task demands. A good example of this is what I talked about in last week's episode. In baseball batting, the task dynamics of modulating timing for different pitch speeds competes with the intrinsic dynamics, which biomechanically constrain the ways in which a powerful swing can be generated. So through practice, skilled batters seem to have found a stable cooperative solution, which involves modulating some segments of the swing 
as a function of pitch speeds and not others. In the paper, the authors next look at the different aspects of the theory in more detail. First, what is exactly meant by the term search here? In this theory, searching is the process of learning to attend to informational variables for the task and modifying actions in terms of these informational variables, resulting in a change in the perceptual motor workspace. Quote from the article, As individuals search through the space of possibilities, they attune to the most useful information, and this modifies ways of acting that afford relevant information variables to be detected. Attunement refers to the process of attending to more useful information for the situation at hand, while changes in action refer to changes in movement patterns to achieve the required response. This cycle of change on the many spaces is what modifies the capacity of perceiving and acting. End quote. Search is, of course, constrained, and thus shaped by the individual task and environmental constraints. Finally, this search occurs whether the individual performer is practicing on their own or learning is guided by a coach. More on that later. Okay, let's unpack this a little more. Let's begin at the beginning. How does a performer initially move through the perceptual motor workspace? Well, as Scott Kelso nicely put it, for most of the tasks we do, we will have, quote, relatively autonomous coordination tendencies that exist before learning something new. That is, when we first start performing a task, there will be relatively stable and relatively unstable regions in the perceptual motor workspace. Since performance in the unstable regions is hard to maintain, this will constrain how the search occurs, at least initially. The most commonly used example to illustrate this is making oscillatory movements with the two limbs, which is a very fancy way of saying playing drums. When you hand a novice a pair of drumsticks and give them the task of playing a consistent rhythm, in other words, playing something like a drum roll, they will search through the perceptual motor workspace to find a solution. In this case, we can describe the workspace in terms of the relative phase between the two sticks. If both sticks move in exactly the same way, they are in phase. If they move in opposite ways, so that when one is contacting the drum, the other is at its maximum height above it, they are antiphase. And there can be an infinite number of combinations in between. So how do we find one to play? Well, as I mentioned a few moments ago, search is initially constrained by our intrinsic dynamics. In the case of playing a drum beat, these dynamics create stable regions in the workspace at in-phase and anti-phase, so the performer will tend to gravitate to one of these movement solutions. For most people, just starting to play drums, other regions, like trying to play in a 90-degree relative phase relationship, will be very unstable, so they will not be used. This behavior has been described in detail in the hawken kelso boons or HKB model that I will dive into in a future episode. So another way to think of this is the intrinsic dynamics of the learner and the initial information variables they use to perform a task will define the form, gradients, and layouts of the perceptual motor workspace. Think of it like rolling hills. Within the valleys, we have stable regions we call attractors. Once we get into a valley, it's hard to get out. We have to climb a hill, and we are very unstable on a hillside. What causes movement through these hills and valleys of the perceptual motor workspace in a new learner? For example, what determines which of the two valleys or attractors, 0 degrees in phase or 180 degrees anti phase, a performer will settle in for the drum roll task? Well, there are two important factors here. First is the set of initial conditions. That is where the performer enters the perceptual motor workspace. This, of course, is something that can be influenced by a coach in practice activities. The other factor is the control parameters chosen for the task. As I discussed back in episode 148, a control parameter is a variable that when changed, causes a change in the emergent movement solution. In the case of a drum roll task, the main such variable is the frequency or speed at which the performer is asked to play. At higher frequencies, there will be a tendency for the performer to move from anti-phase to in-phase. So that's what happens when we first perform a task. What changes as we practice? Well, for given a goal of trying to maintain a different relative phase, say 90 degrees out of phase, or in other words, we have a new task constraint imposed on us, in the search strategies approach, it is proposed that this will eventually lead to a deformation or change in the perceptual motor landscape, with new attractors in the intrinsic dynamics developing at the goal phase. To quote from the article, the perceptual motor workspace is non-stationary, there's a fundamental process via which practice modifies and in turn is influenced by the dynamics of the perceptual motor workspace. 
Through practice, and more generally individual interactions with the environment, the perceptual motor workspace is modified. That is, action continuously modifies qualitatively and quantitatively the landscape dynamics of the perceptual motor workspace. The search through the workspace changes through attunement to the information in the perceptual array and mapping of movement to it. In the context of action, this mechanism of change channels the search strategy within or between trials of practice. This complementary process of the perceptual motor workspace maps to Gibson's theoretical position that we perceive in order to move and that we move in order to perceive. End quote. That last sentence is particularly important. Within the perceptual motor workspace, our actions are of course guided by the pickup of perceptual information, but we also act so that we gather more and new perceptual information sources. The final point to make here is that individuals differ in terms of their intrinsic dynamics, leading to differences already when starting the practice. For example, Kelso has found that a small number of individuals present stable performance at the 90 degrees phase pattern right away when they start practicing. So far, we've looked at the perceptual motor workspace. That is the relationship between the possible movement solutions and the information or task dynamics. As the authors nicely described, another important step in understanding this process is by considering the performer's goal. Quote, Although individuals modify their bodily actions in terms of the attended information and environmental constraints, there is a goal that also constrains the system into a coherent form. How the task goal constrains the behavior can be observed through a formalism called task space. Simply put, the task space relates the movement possibilities and performance. End quote. For this, let's look at a different task, throwing a ball so that it hits a target on the floor. Furthermore, let's ignore lateral error and only look at whether the throw is the correct distance or not. The task space relates the movement possibilities and performance. Performance here is determined by the distance our throw travels. For movement possibilities, let's assume there are only two things that the performer can control, the vertical and horizontal release velocities. In the search strategies approach, these are called elemental variables, and they have the requirement that they be independently controllable. Now from basic physics, we can create an equation to describe the error for our task. The distance the ball will travel equals 2 times the vertical velocity times the horizontal velocity, all divided by gravity. To get error, we just subtract this value from the actual distance of the target. In 2015, Pacheco and Newell simulated the simplified throwing task and modeled the results using the task space I just described. What was found? First, in looking just at error, they saw some evidence of individual differences in acquisition. One of the participants examined used what they called a bracketing strategy, that is, a tendency to decrease errors by alternating. So in other words, they threw way too long, then way too short, then slightly long, then slightly short, honing in on an accurate throw. Other participants used more of what they called a creeping strategy, a systematic decrease in error with a constant sign, so throwing way too long, slightly too long, then on target. Next, in looking at task space, the authors could identify the movement strategies used by the different participants. For example, the participant that used the bracketing strategy solved the movement problem by varying their action along a single dimension. That is, they altered the throw by altering both the vertical and horizontal velocity in the same ratio. This was the case even though they were of course free to explore and combine these elemental variables in almost any way. An interesting question the authors asked was whether this individual changed their coordination pattern during learning. To do this, they plotted the task space separately for each day of training. It was found that the participant completely changed the region of task space used from day two to day three. In other words, they use a different ratio for vertical to horizontal velocities. Furthermore, this change was non-continuous. There were no data points that connected the two regions of task space. Instead, it appears as if this individual had two stable coordination patterns. Interestingly, it was also found that such shifts in coordination were typically preceded by a period of high variability, suggesting that the individual was beginning to explore task space. From these observations, Pacheco and Newell identify three different processes of learning in the search strategy approach. Movement in the space that maintains the same coordination pattern and changes its scaling only reflects a process of parameterization, 
So for example, in the throwing tasks example, this occurred when the participant increased or decreased both the vertical and horizontal velocity of the throw while keeping them at the same ratio. When the coordination pattern changes or moves to a different area in the task space to accommodate new task requirements, this is called a shift. This occurred when the thrower adopted a new ratio of velocities, for example. Finally, bifurcation is the process by which the new coordination pattern the individual has shifted to stabilizes over time. In the task space, the shift would initially appear as one single trial in a new area of task space. Bifurcation would be characterized by a distribution of trials clustering around this new area thereafter. One last point before leaving the concept of task space. Although performance or error feedback is a source of information that a performer uses to achieve their goal, it does not determine how individuals act in some situations. In some cases, an individual must move away from a valley in task space. That is a location where they're consistently producing reasonably low errors. This is done to find solutions that may be more appropriate for their own intrinsic dynamics, maybe to prevent long-term injury, or to improve performance even further. This would likely involve an initial increase in performance error. This phenomenon is sometimes called the exploration-exploitation dilemma. That is, the fight between maintaining a given strategy with a known performance return and exploring other strategies with unknown but potentially higher returns. What is the role of coaching and practice design in the search strategies approach? In the model, the role of the coach is to manipulate aspects of the task constraints to guide learners to specific regions of the perceptual motor workspace and task space. Quote from the article, Augmented information, such as instructions, demonstrations, and cueing, provided by a coach, provides forward-looking information directing the learner towards relevant aspects of the to-be-learned skill. In this way, augmented information can be thought of as an informational constraint on action. In our terms, this constraint would limit the search space of the task, guiding the learner to the most appropriate space of the task to perform, end quote. And that to avoid over-constraining the solution, quote, particular movement forms should not be imposed. The teacher should use instructions as a means of facilitating the search for a coordinative solution, end quote. So the coach does not passively stand back and let the learner go to any old area in the solution space, nor do they direct them to an exact solution. Another way to alter the movement through task space in coaching is by manipulating the feedback given to the performer, which I of course talked about on the podcast many times now. To sum up, Newell and colleagues have proposed a theoretical framework of learning as searching within the perceptual motor workspace for a solution to the task. Performing this type of analysis of things like drumming and throwing tasks have allowed researchers to understand the intrinsic coordination tendencies of a performer and how this changes through practice. It also clearly shows that individual performers have a range of differences in terms of their initial conditions, where they start in the workspace, their motion through the task space, and how they choose to exploit redundancy. Even when individuals start with the same initial conditions, they often diverge to find different solutions to the same motor task. While this search strategies approach shows great promise, as the authors acknowledge, there's still a lot more work needed in particular linking the movement through task space to informational variables to determine what guides the movement, and addressing the problem of scaling up this analysis to more complex tasks that involve more than just two elemental variables. What are the implications of this theory for coaches? Well, I think it's important for a coach to think about what type of learning process they're trying to encourage with a particular practice activity. Are you happy with the coordination solution the performer is using and just want to focus on parameterization? Do you want to encourage a shift to a totally different solution? Have they found a new solution that is preferable, but a bit unstable, and you want to focus on the process of bifurcation? Also, a key part of coaching is to help a performer solve the exploration-exploitation dilemma by using the appropriate practice activities at the appropriate time. Relevant to this point, in their throwing study, Pacheco and Newell found that transfer to a novel throwing task was best for individuals that maintained a balanced strategy between exploring and exploiting. I'll be looking more specifically at how practice activities influence search in future episodes. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakeawaits. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. 
finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including an extra monthly episode and written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perception action. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Yeah.